outdoor cultivation of, of GMOs is probably the you know single largest uncontrolled experiment that human beings have ever engaged in. You cannot make determinations as to exactly what the long-term impact of that cultivation is going to be. And certainly running a single or limited trial is not going to give you a window on what the multi-generational impacts are going to be. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com coming to you on the 5th of July, 2016. And today we're talking to Dr. Robert Verkirk of the Alliance for Natural Health at anhinternational.org. Link in the show notes, as always. And uh, Dr. Verkirk has authored some 60 papers in scientific journal journals and conference proceedings, as well as being a regular uh, feature in magazines and other popular media on the subject of sustainability in healthcare, agriculture, food quality, and related fields. But today we're going to be talking specifically about a op-ed that he wrote for ANH International recently entitled The UK Royal Society Whitewash on GM Crops, talking about a new Roy- or a recent Royal Society report called GM Plants Questions and Answers, seeking to quell the public's dis-ease with the uh, GMO crops that are increasingly a part of their food supply. Now, uh, there is a lot to go through here. Um, So, first of all, thank you for joining us on the program today, Dr. Verkirk. But perhaps we can start by setting the table for the international audience who may or may not know the context of this Royal Society report. Can you tell us, in a nutshell, what the Royal Society is, what this report says, and why it's important that the Royal Society issued this report? Well, yes, the um, the Royal Society has uh, long been the most learned society on scientific matters. It's a key advisor to the UK government. Um, the bottom line is it has also been very close to issues relating to GM for many years. And, of course, what is interesting is that the UK government has for some time, and it's particularly pertinent we should be discussing this uh, a few days after the British public has voted to exit the European Union, it has been at odds with um, many other governments within the EU that have towed a very, very cautious line, um, particularly with respect to cultivation of GM crops on European soils. Um, I think what, what a lot of people have misunderstood in in the United States and Canada, for example, is that they they think that um, the whole of the EU is a no-go area for GM. Um, The bottom line is that isn't the case. Um, GM foods for human consumption as well as animal consumption are allowed on the basis that they're labeled. And this is one of the reasons there's been such a a big um, debate over whether to force mandatory labeling for GM in the United States. And the bottom line is what the European experience has shown is that if you do not um, um, have to, well, let's look at it the other way around. If you, if you are forced to label a particular food as containing genetically modified organisms, people generally don't buy it. And, um, and that's the main reason that there's very, very little human food on the EU market that is GM. Um, Looking at animal food, on the other hand, um, the vast majority of compounded animal feed, around about 85% of it, which still requires um, mandatory GMO labeling, um, is already GM. So um, the animals can't read English, French, German, um, or any of the other languages. And um, there is a a big debate amongst farmers whether it's good or bad for the animals. And um, I think... You know, as the Royal Society rightly indicates, this is a contentious subject. And the reason why it is contentious is because there is either in key areas a limited amount of data or there is a lot of conflicting data. And when you start to look closely at why that might be, you start to see a number of processes like who is controlling the funding of research, um, what kinds of research are being, uh, is being carried out, um, where are the information gaps. And um, frankly, this is where I see the, the current, Royal, the, the most recent Royal Society report as a, as a big disappointment because it, it actually does not seek to resolve 
some of the really big issues and you know the 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 really big issues are what happens if you start cultivating gm crops on european soils when you've got farm sizes that are a fraction of the size of um, north american farms what happens to organic agriculture that um, cannot by definition cannot sustain any significant contamination from from gm crops um, what happens in, in, in terms of the, you know, the coexistence policies between organic and, and conventional? Um, what are the health effects? What are the environmental effects? What happens to the issues over super weeds or super bugs that are very, very clearly demonstrated um, in the peer-reviewed scientific literature? And these are issues that could have been handled but have been um, absolutely ignored in the latest report. Unfortunately so, and you do indicate that the Royal Society report does exist and, and is there presumably because this is a contentious issue and they are seeking to inform the public about this issue, but unfortunately they do not inform the public about many of the issues uh, that you've just talked about. Now, one of the ones that captured my attention was the first one you address in your own op-ed on this report. There is no scientific consensus on safety. And although I don't believe this uh, Royal Society report comes flat out and says there is a scientific consensus that it is safe in positive absolute terms, it certainly does give that impression and the implication of that. But you point out something that, although I do follow the uh, the latest on, on GMO uh, food and research, I had not seen this in particular. An actual uh, report that I believe, a, a peer-reviewed journal entry that I believe was published in 2014, a statement signed by over 300 scientists saying that there is, quote, no scientific consensus on GMO safety, which seems to fly in the face of certainly the implications of that Royal Society report and obviously a lot of the uh, contrary uh, word that is spread by the biotech industry. Can you tell us a little bit about that statement and its significance? Well, yes. Um, James, if you were to ask someone um, what is the consensus about the, you know, the, the function, say, of an internal combustion engine, you would be unlikely to ask a medical doctor. Um, conversely, if you wanted to know exactly how the organs work together and create a functioning body, you probably wouldn't ask a, a, a motor mechanic. And the bottom line is when it comes to consensus, one has to be very careful about which particular group of scientists. It is, um, frankly, a very, very broad church of experts covering all sorts of disciplines. And if you were to say, right, the scientists who have been engaged in biotechnology um, broadly agree that GM is a good thing, well, yes, we would have agreement. Um, however, my own view is that what you really need to be looking at is people who have specific qualifications and expertise in the fields of ecology um, and environmental sustainability. And then it's worth looking at, for example, organizations like the European Network um, of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility that were the, was the key organization that pulled together the 300 um, scientists that um, um, have basically signed the, um, the statement um, in a peer-reviewed journal that, that indicates that there is no consensus to remind people that when you look at um, people who have specific expertise in agroecology, for example, um, and sustainable agriculture, um, they will consistently say that there, is, there is no agreement. And in fact, in general terms, if you're going to look at the single biggest research project in this area, the ISTAT report in 2008 that was co-chaired by Dr. Hans Herren, who's uh, now heads up the um, Washington-based Millennium Institute, um, he has been consistently outspoken saying that if you look at the overall impact, and, and of course it's not just the human health and environmental impacts, it is the socioeconomic impacts and the sustainability issues. As soon as you move to a biotech approach, you have to take into account what comes with it. And what comes with it, for example, is the fact that the single biggest trait um, involves 
the use of um, herbicide-resistant crops, including glyphosate. Now, in the Royal Society report, glyphosate does not appear um, other than in one indirect mention in the early part of the report. And yet, this is a key part of it. Um, and, of course, it's uh, very, very fitting that it should have been discussed, given last year the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is a subdivision of the World Health Organization, declared glyphosate um, a probable human carcinogen. Um, so you, you have to look at the, the role of, of, uh, of glyphosate, for example. Um, you also have to look at, the, at, at other issues, such as the centralization of the agricultural resource. Um, uh, uh, you know, Hans Heron and, and, and many others, including myself, have worked many years on development projects in sub-Saharan Africa. One of the reasons that many sub-Saharan African countries um, are not happy about the general shift towards GMOs is because their farmers, rather than setting aside, say, 10% of land that would be used to raise seed, which is really how humans have got to where we are as agricultural people. We have um, raised our own seed, would then have to come with cash in hand back to a small number of companies like Monsanto and say, can we buy your seed now for our next crop? Um, and centralizing the agricultural resource is, is a real issue when you're trying to create um, you know, agroecological sustainable systems. One of the most head-scratching quotations from this report for me is uh, in the section where they talk about, is it safe to eat GM crops, where they conclude, yes, quite definitively, they say, yes, it is. Um, but they also say this, there have been a few studies claiming damage to human or animal health from specific foods that have been developed using GM. The claims were not about the GM method itself, but about the specific gene introduced into the crop or about agricultural practices associated with the crop, crop, such as herbicide treatments, which is such a bizarre way of trying to address the issue. It almost seems to me like saying, no, this person wasn't run over by a car. They were run over by a blue 1999 Honda Civic. It's a completely different phenomenon. It just seems so strange that they would try to deflect it in that manner. Um, Talk to us about the, the way that this report is written and the, the, the level that they're aiming it at for their audience. Well, again, it's, it's not written in a deeply scientific manner. It's, um, it's uh, you know, Dr. Ramakrishnan, the president of the Royal Society, you know, makes clear in his foreword that this is really a report that's designed to allay public concerns or, dare I say, fears over GM. And so by its very nature, it says, you know, we, big brother, have overviewed the, 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 the science. We think it indicates um, that, that uh, GM is safe. And we're not going to bother you with any real detail. So the real key scientific discourses that create contention are absolutely left out of the report. And, you know, to us as scientists who are, you know, wanting to look at um, specific discussions o over the, you know, epigenetic or molecular level of impact that genetically modified crops may have on, on animals um, and, and uh, non-target organisms, and also on other crops, and to look at things like transgene flow, how um, genetic traits might escape the original host plant and, and move into uh, uh, non-crop plants, and what the long-term ecological impact of that. That's the, the super weeds issue that I, I believe is actually one of the most serious um, issues that faces um, herbicide resistant crops that still remain the most important group. Um, and if you look at the, you know, I, I've been involved closely with this issue from, from its outset. I mean, while I was at Imperial College London, um, the first outdoor trial in the UK um, took place on our field plots at Imperial College London, just um, 40 miles outside the centre of London. And there were a handful of, of us who objected to this, who wrote a, a short paper in, in, in a peer-reviewed paper concerned about the issues 
potential issues of, of escape. Um, and this is when, at that time, um, the companies that were behind this were suggesting that all you would need would be a 250-meter physical barrier between GM and non-GM, um, which has, of course, now been proven to be a complete fallacy um, in order to prevent any transgene flow. Um, what they're having to argue now is, is that, of course, um, well, transgene flow is actually part of nature. And in fact, soil microbes regularly move genes around and therefore this is a natural process. Um, it is natural when the trait is natural. We have to understand what is natural and what, what is um, the result of human intervention. And the bottom line is if you force a particular trait that nature didn't create, you are starting to play, play with a different set of rules than those that have actually got evolution um, of this extraordinary diversity of organisms to, to the, the present point in time. Um, another major issue is that if you're going to accept, and it's interesting that within European law, this is actually now, um, has, has legal standing. If you're going to accept the principle, the precautionary principle, which is that you um, basically undertake, w w where, where there is a, a risk over a particular technology, you take those measures that um, apply the lowest level of risk, you would have to have a moratorium on, on GM immediately, just on the basis of the existing information. And again, in order to get to the position that the Royal Society has taken, they have ignored the fact that, um, that uh, the precautionary principle is mandated through European law. Of course, that, that is in question now as... Um, Britain early next year starts its process of negotiating its way out of the European Union. But um, it, is, it is a very important principle given that, again, so much of the science suggests that actually we can feed the world's population using traditional propagation techniques. And, um, and actually many of the um, real wins that were um, proclaimed to be definites in terms of GMO have never come to pass. And in fact, that's one of the reasons we still, um, nearly 30 years on, have only a handful of traits that have made it into commercial production because most of them have failed. Um, many of those failures we never get to hear about because they remain in the confines of laboratories and, and government regulators and trials. And um, one can only assume that they have failed for a range of reasons. And we know particularly from the example of tryptophan, the GM tryptophan, that, that the risk can be very significant indeed. Well, to be fair, the Royal Society report at least does acknowledge the failure, for example, of golden rice. But don't worry, they're, they're still working on it and they're learning from their mistakes, as the Royal Society assures us. Um, you, you point out that this is not written as a scientific report, and it certainly is not. Because again, going back to that section on is it safe to eat GM crops, the answer begins yes, there is no evidence that a crop is dangerous to eat just because it is GM, which seems to me a double deflection or a, 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 a wrong way around the question, because, because there is no evidence that it is dangerous does not mean that it is safe, but also uh, no, no evidence that it is dangerous to eat just because it is GM. I'm not sure that's exactly the, the charge that's being leveled. Certainly, it's not that anything that is GM is automatically going to be unsafe, but there certainly could be developments within genetically modified foods that could be unsafe, which again seems to be excluded from that formulation. Formulations like that within a document provided by the Royal Society, which are inherently unscientific and full of logical fallacies, seems so strange to people who would expect the Royal Society. Why would they even be addressing issues that are really outside of the purview of their scientific uh, st their status to speak for, for the scientific community, assuming there is such a thing. Uh, I wonder, uh, is there any possible answer to that question other than there is some agenda here to be promoting by bio the biotech industry? Well, there, there has always been um, a motive within science to support research. And I think that the bottom line is that um, any... Um, organization that seeks to do research, whether it's research on impact or research on the development of new technologies, um, 
could be viewed as good for the sci- good for science and therefore good for economies. Um, and there is no doubt if you look at the background of of Rothamsted um, in the UK, which is where a lot of agricultural science first really evolved in its present form. Um, the UK has a, has a very very strong history in in crop research and also in biotechnology research. Um, so. Yes, I mean there, there is. I think a, if you look at the fact that this is the third such report, um, the Royal Society produced one report in 1998, another one in 2002, and now the Q and A in 2016. Um, frankly, the quality of the science that's being discussed is getting weaker through those three successive reports, and and. In our mind, this is this is why it is so important that issues like this are discussed, so that you know the public can be shown other sources. And we've done this. You know, we we believe that the the myths and truths um, document that we point to is a, is is probably a a very useful um, counter argument that that brings up um, hundreds of different um, peer reviewed papers that suggest. Um, there are some very, very big question marks around the continued use of, of GM crops. But um, yes, it is essentially a whitewash um, in order to keep the, the GM machine on the rails, um, you know, carrying out more research. The, the Cartagena Protocol specifically um, requires that a case-by-case approach is actually taken with regard to safety because, as you rightly indicated, you cannot, um, just as you can't say that all pharmaceutical drugs are by definition dangerous or that all foods are by definition safe, you also cannot categorize um, in one generic group all biotech traits and biotech crops. So it is entirely sensible that a case-by-case approach be taken. And um, you may be aware that um, the key European Biotech Association, Europa Bio, has been banging the drum for a long time, criticizing the slow rate at which um, the European Food Safety Authority has been approving um, authorizations for for GMOs. They've now got about 50 GMO crops um, through the door. The problem is that countries don't want to cultivate them. So what this report is about is to try and take off, certainly in the UK, the pressure from the public that has been the single biggest stumbling block really around the whole of the EU to to cultivation. And, um, you know, I've often maintained that outdoor cultivation of, of GMOs is probably the, you know, single largest uncontrolled experiment that human beings have ever engaged in. You cannot, based on, um, on lab studies, make determinations as to exactly what the long-term impact of that cultivation is going to be. And certainly running a single limited trial is not going to give you a window on what the multi-generational impacts are going to be um, environmentally in terms of health and also in terms of social impacts and uh, sustainability impacts. Well, the stakes could not really be bigger. And as you say, this is obviously a developing story as Britain starts to extricate itself from the EU. And we see how that shakes out in terms of what the regulatory environment will be and whether they will continue to conform to the EU standards or whether they will try to more aggressively push for biotech and uh, genetically modified organisms. So it will certainly be interesting to see how this develops. And I'm sure people can stay in touch with anhinternational.org for the developments for people who are just encountering the Alliance for Natural Health for the first time. Can you tell them a little bit about the organization and what they can find at the website? Yes, um, we're, we're a non-profit um, research education um, uh, organization that, that has also had a long history of some 15 years also campaigning on, on natural health issues. Um, essentially, our mission is to encourage um, greater use of natural health um, for healthcare sustainability. Um, we've seen sustainability being applied to, to agriculture, to energy, to forestry, um, even to tourism. And it's um, rather 
strange that it has very rarely been applied to healthcare when um, most um, researchers who are looking closely at the issue of healthcare um, as, as well as independent think tanks are suggesting um, modern medicine is uh, leading us at about 100 miles an hour into a brick wall because of the chronic disease crisis and that chronic disease crisis is manifest largely because of um, poor dietary and lifestyle choices. So um, we, we are really helping people to use what we call good science and good law to find ways of managing their own health um, as best they can to take the pressure off the system, um, to uh, find ways of reducing the risk of, of chronic diseases um, so that we can actually use the existing healthcare system um, more usefully when we suffer acute injuries and, and other issues. There is so much that we can do by managing our health. And in this um, way, we, we really have divided our work into a number of campaigns. Um, GMOs is one of them because we believe that um, it is essential that we maintain access to um, unadulterated um, whole foods that can be consumed with as um, little damaging damage from really the time of cultivation through to the time of consumption. Um, and um, But we also cover a wide range of other issues, um, including uh, clean water, uh, natural health cho choices, um, uh, traditional herbal medicinal um, cultures. Um, so... You can find out um, a lot more if you go to our website, which is at ANH, which stands for Alliance for Natural Health, ANH International, all one word, dot org. That's ANH International dot org. Um, and you can subscribe to a, a free newsletter that comes out every Wednesday that keeps you uh, tuned with what we're doing. We also have um, a, a U.S.-based organization that you can find at ANH-USA.org that will keep you posted um, on similar and related issues in, in the United States. Well, Dr. Verkirk, thank you very much for your time today, and thank you for spreading awareness on this important issue. Thank you very much, and James. It's been a real pleasure. The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com support.